Okay, so this begins um, a completely new unit. We are into unit two, and it is really over um, nation building. So it goes all the way from road to revolution through um, the adoption of the Constitution. So it seems as if it shouldn't be a, a very much amount of time, but it, it is. And so a lot is um, jam-packed into this unit, but we're still going to go chapter by chapter. So this is chapter five, The Road to Revolution. And the dates that this um, covers is 1745 to 1776. Um, in the past, some of my students have gotten irritated with the textbook because it tends to jump around in time. It's not completely chronological. It goes more um, topic to topic. And this is really, this gets really apparent when we start in this unit. Um, and I mean, I, I kind of understand it. It's, it's just because there's so much going on and you don't want to confuse everyone by putting every single thing that happened in this particular year at the same spot. But it can get if, if that's how your brain works, it can get very, very irritating. I really like this particular quote. Um, the past is messier than it looks in history books. The story we tell looking backward already has an ending. All we have to do is connect the dots in a way that leads up to it. The present has no ending. The story is up for grabs. I think this is... Um, one of my favorite quotes about history because we tend to, with, with hindsight, we can make things a lot neater and more organized than they really were at the time. And we can kind of say, well, you know, I think this is why this happened. But, um, you know, if we consider it in the context of our own lives, some stuff is just dumb luck. And people hate to think that because of um, someone like stumbling upon something, we are where we are today. But I kind of think that is the, um, I think that's pretty awesome. The fact that, you know, it just is sometimes just that random that ends up creating the future. Okay, so if we're talking um, North America in the 1700s, we're really talking about two um, separate empires. You have the British Empire and you have the French. So um, the Spanish are still down in South America and Mexico. But really, when we are talking what we consider the United States, it's all um, the British and the French. So, okay. The question, what caused conflict between the two? Um, there are people who devote their entire lives to trying to figure out why these two countries hated each other. A lot of it was just poor decision making um, throughout the years. There were kings of England who claimed the Brit who claimed the uh, French throne. There were French kings who claimed the British throne. Most of it is due to family infighting and then tradition. So basically, we've hated each other for so long, um, we're going to continue to hate each other. But when we're talking about North America, our conflict is really... I don't know. It's 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 less of a direct conflict and more of a we know that these people are out there. And so it's more of a threat than it is we're going to, you know, have um, direct conflict with the other party. Because we just have so much land and so many places for people to spread out on. So. We have more Native Americans living in territory that the French have claimed. And it all goes back to the way um, the settlers really look at the country and how they interact with um, what is already here. The French aren't so much making permanent settlements like the British are. They're really more trappers, um, hunters. They're kind of using um, North America as 
raw material gathering instead of we are going to send a bunch of people here and make a new um, settlement. So you have competing interests. And since the French really aren't trying to make these giant, you know, colonies, the Native Americans are more comfortable in French-owned territories. And also the French kind of worked with the Native Americans. They would integrate into that whichever um, culture they happen to be around. So less of, hey, you know, I know the right thing, so you need to do it. And more, okay, well, you know, you've been living here for a while. It seems like you've got a handle on things. Let me copy you. Um, they didn't, the French didn't try to take Native American lands. They just wanted to, you know, look for the resources on it. The British really needed farmland as we have more and more colonists coming over. Um, they're, they're moving further into the interior and they are taking what is considered Native Americans land to make farms. By the 1740s, um, we have British settlers moving into the Ohio River Valley, and this land is actually claimed by the French. So the French are not happy with this at all, um, that we're having British settlers now coming into land that they have traditionally held. So if we're looking here, um, the blue part is what is claimed by France, and then Great Britain has that kind of like salmony pink color. If you, in looking for the Ohio River Valley, look um, kind of where it's in the blue, it's right, it's north of Kentucky, um, in the area where it says Fort Duquesne in uh, Pennsylvania, that's the area that we're talking about. So it is a lot of land, but then it isn't a lot of land when we're talking um, settlement. And so you can see there, too, that um, Spain still has this orange area. Florida has always been weird, and it's just Florida. So um, these kind of grayish spots, it's not that no one claims it. It's just that it's pretty much unsettled. So there isn't a lot of a population there, um, and no one's going to, you know, go to war to try to claim that weird random spot in Alabama. So the French start building forts um, to claim their land between Lake Erie and the Ohio River. So if we go back to our map, these forts are, like I said, right where Fort Duquesne is, um, and it's spelled Duquesne, but it's pronounced Duquesne. So if you're like going, I don't know where that is, um, that's what it looks like. It looks like Duquesne. So um, Lake Erie is a great lake right there next to Ohio and Pennsylvania, um, kind of south of Detroit. So this is where the French start building um, forts to kind of reinforce their claim on the area. The Virginia colony is not really happy about this because they claimed this interior area um, themselves. So at the time, there was no like hard boundary where Virginia ended. So they just kind of said, hey, that's ours. We, you know, we go inland and that's part of us. Um, the Virginia governor sends soldiers to tell the French to leave because that's always worked in the past? I, I don't know. I, I don't understand why he thought that was going to be an effective method of um, diplomacy, but I guess you have to start somewhere. He decides to choose a young 21-year-old surveyor um, who is in the Virginia militia. His name is George Washington. He is the one who leads this group of soldiers um, into the interior to try to get the French out of the Ohio River Valley. He goes, um, keep in mind, a militia is not a formal army. A militia is just a bunch of regular citizens who are willing, who have, you know, pledged themselves willing to go and defend their area. So this isn't like, okay, we're sending um, an, you know, an army troop in. It's not that at all. It's just kind of like, hey, it's a bunch of people who they're ordinary citizens, but, you know, they're willing to defend themselves. So George Washington goes in, he leads his men into the Ohio River Valley. 
um, he comes back and says, hey, governor, yeah, the French said, no, we're not leaving. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to go back. I'm not done with the story, my bad. Okay, so again, the after this, I thought I had a, um, a slide to talk about this more, but apparently I did not. All right, so the next year, Washington goes back into this kind of Ohio River um, Valley wilderness, and he goes to where the, he has orders to build a fort where the Allegheny and the Monongahela River meet to form the Ohio River. So right at the um, fork in the the rivers, or I guess not even a fort, but like where they form, where they meet to join um, the larger river. The fort are already there. Um, they have already built Fort Duquesne, again, the one that looks like Duquesne. Washington hears through um, some spies that the French are looking for him, and he decides that he and his troops are going to um, intercept these French who are, you know, kind of on the hunt for him. He and his men, they attack um, with some native allies, and they defeat this French party. They then retreat to kind of an open area, and they build a small fort called Fort Necessity. Um, then the, the larger French force finds them and pretty much takes them out. They force Washington to surrender. They let Washington and some of his men go home to Virginia to say, um, basically, hey, you're the messenger now. Go back and tell them we're not surrendering. This is ours. Okay, so um, I put this on here again. If you look at kind of in the pinkish area towards the left-hand side, you can see Fort Duquesne um, in blue. And then you see red British victory. That would be Washington. And then you see a French victory. That would be where he got defeated. And um, Fort Necessity is in red. So all of these areas is where you see conflict. Um, when we are talking about the French and Indian War, we are also talking about something called the Seven Years' War that is also being fought in Europe. So it's really just that the French and Indian War is the North American theater. So when I say theater, I'm talking about where the war is being fought. Um, usually people are more familiar with the term in reference to like World War II. So you have the European theater. That's where World War II was fought in Europe. You have the Pacific Theater. That's where World War II was fought in the Pacific. But here in the Seven Years' War, America becomes, I mean, this is the, the we, we end up calling it the French and Indian War because we're just concerned with, you know, how it affected us. But for the rest of the world, um, this is just the American theater of the Seven Years' War. Okay, see, I knew I had a slide. This is the slide that I thought I was on, but you know, then I saw the map and I got all confused. All right, so Albany Congress. All of these con all of these like little skirmishes in the Ohio River Valley and the fact that the British and the French are just being antagonistic towards each other um, in Europe, everyone says, okay, war is about to break out. We need to prepare. The Albany Congress is called um, the British government calls it, they want colonial leaders to meet and kind of agree to cooperate on defending themselves. They're, you know, they're mainly kind of thinking we don't have the manpower to actually fight a war on all of these fronts. So, hey, colonists, you got to get in gear. The, um, British also invited the Iroquois to kind of come to this conference. And they really wanted the Iroquois to join the British in an alliance against the French. So hopefully the Iroquois nation, which was very powerful at the time, um, would join the British and then they could help defeat the French. The Iroquois, when they get there, they're like, this is, no, we're not doing this. They kind of look around and see all these colonists and they think there's no way these people are going to 
defeat the French. They, they, they didn't join because they just did not think that the British could win, could win. Um, Benjamin Franklin is actually, he represents Pennsylvania here and he's a pretty vocal, hold on, let me see what the next slide is. Yes. He is a very vocal, um, member of this Congress, the Albany Congress. This is where we get the um, snake picture, join or die, meaning if these colonies don't unite, then the French are going to take us out one by one. Franklin authors the Albany Plan of the Union, and it is um, kind of a rudimentary um, way the colonies can come together and defend themselves. It's he wants to have a council of representatives that are elected by our colonial assemblies. So basically, um, the citizens elect the representatives to the assemblies, and then the assemblies rep elect representatives to an overall colonial um, council. They want, in this document, this council would have authority over the Western settlements, they would also have authority um, with um, kind of contact and diplomacy with Native Americans and a few other things that needs to happen for all of the colonies rather than each one of the colonies individually. The big thing, too, is that this um, representative council could organize armies and collect taxes to pay its expenses. This sounds very similar to... A constitution. The British don't like that. Um, the Albany Congress is in favor of it, but eventually our colonial assemblies reject it. Um, the British also don't really, you know, push it through because they're like, uh, I don't think they needed to have the ability to um, tax themselves and have armies because as soon as you get an army, you can rebel. The other colonies, they kind of had this, um, it, I mean, I guess it still goes on today, where it's regional interests versus a national one. There was absolutely no idea or no um, kind of concept of this national unity that we have now. And so these colonies were like, well, I'm, I'm wondering what's going to happen for Massachusetts or, you know, Virginia doesn't want to do that. So it, it was it was kind of defeated because... Um, I mean, I would say short-sightedness, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe this made sense. Who knows? But yes, it never got adopted. So there we are. Um, you do not have to do this assignment, online students. Okay, so here is actual pictures of um, what we're looking at when we talk about Fort Duquesne and the Ohio River and um, the Allegheny River. See, this is where, um, if you're looking at the right-hand side, the lower right-hand side, this is where the Allegheny and the Mongahela River meet to form the Ohio. That's where Washington was supposed to have built his fort, but uh -huh, Fort Duquesne is already there, and you can still go see it. Okay, so the British decide that we have got to get the French out of the Ohio River Valley. In 1755, General Edward Braddock is sent to Virginia, and he has orders to capture Fort Duquesne. Braddock gets there. He has a lot of um, British regulars, so this is what we would call the Redcoats. And George Washington ends up joining Braddock's forces as a militia volunteer. Now, Duquesne is an overall disaster for the British. Um, Braddock understands these military tactics that are used in Europe. And that's when, you know, you all line up basically and take turns shooting each other. In North America, we have a whole lot of woodland. So we don't really have these large battlefields where you can spread out and line up and then say, okay, I shoot now, you shoot then. Um, it's more guerrilla tactics, and especially when you have the Native Americans who understand this um, area that they're fighting in, it's, it's not the same at all. So we're sending someone to go fight a war in an area he doesn't understand using tactics that don't work where he's going. 
He also has zero respect for any kind of colonists. He's like, these people are backwoods. They are uneducated. They're definitely not as good as me because I am super British. And so I know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, he ends up, hold on. I want to make sure I have my notes in order because I write all over the place and I don't want to talk to you. Okay, I see what I mean. All right. So he doesn't listen to any of the soldiers, any of the um, colonists who are like, hey, dude, you're telling us to march down this really narrow road. Um, there are forests all around us and we are wearing bright red. This is not going to work. This is a bad idea. They can obviously see us. I mean, you know, people wear bright orange now when they go hunting so that someone doesn't shoot them. The red coat is the, um, you know, kind of like the antique version of Hunter Orange. And if you're trying to not get shot because everybody's your friend, that's great. But if you're in a war and you're trying to, like, you know, do a military maneuver, that doesn't work so well. Um, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, you know, as he's kind of talking to Braddock, he's like, hey, look, you you got to be careful because these French have been... Um, they're, they're really cool with the Indians and the Indians are going to tell them how they fight wars and that's not how you fight a war and they're going to ambush you and it's going to be bad. And Braddock was like, oh no, it's not going to happen. My troops are too well trained. Um, there is something called the Battle of Mongahela. Um, Braddock's forces are marching towards Fort Duquesne in early July. And they get ambushed. They were about 10 miles, um, like, in the vicinity of Fort Duquesne. And the natives <laughs> go, like, super metal. And um, they use some psychological war warfare. So they kill the people. And then when they kill them, they nail the dead British soldiers' scalps to the trees um, as kind of like a, hey, look what we did, and this is what could happen to you. The British soldiers actually outnumber the French and the Indian troops, but the British are on the defensive. They're not used to fighting on this kind of terrain. They're not used to fighting this kind of a um, foe. And so Braddock, he tries to keep his battalions organized, but this ends up making them targets because you're putting them in these organized groups of soldiers and it's like, oh, thank you. I just, you know, can shoot that organized group now instead of having to look all around to find them. Um, Braddock, hold on, Washington. Okay, so it makes all of these troops targets and Washington, who is, he, he doesn't really have a real role. He just it was like, hey, I'm a militiaman. I volunteer. And they're like, okay, sure, whatever. He's kind of in the back. And he forms kind of a rear guard with his militiamen. And this allows the British to retreat. But what ends up happening is Braddock leads 1,300 men into battle. 456 of these men were killed. And 422 were wounded. Um... Daniel Boone is involved in this battle along with his cousin Daniel Morgan and both of them are going to become important in the Revolutionary War. This is one of the most disastrous battles for British um, regulars in British colonial history. So more people, th th this was bad. And if you are, if you're a fan of Hamilton, the song um, where... Washington is saying that he watched his men got slaughtered. He led them into a massacre. That's what he's talking about. It's this battle. The British end up having other losses. Um, the governor of Massachusetts led an army to Fort Niagara in New York, which is also, it's on Lake Ontario. Um, they try to take this fort and they fail. An army of British colonists and Native Americans are ambushed near a place called Lake George. And the Iroquois are kind of sitting back watching this going, oh, yeah, that was a good idea that we didn't join with those people because look how badly they're doing. They're doing just horribly. 
And like I said, um, this is considered the North American theater in the Seven Years' War. In May 1756, Britain formally declares war on France. And so this is the official beginning of the Seven Years' War, even though it's been unofficially having been fought forever. I guess, you know, everybody needs a date, I suppose. Soon after that, the French troops capture um, a fort that's held by the British called Fort Oswego. And then they also capture Fort William Henry. So the British are doing very poorly, very badly, very, very badly. Finally, we get a new prime minister in England named William Pitt. This is 1757. Um, instead of just going for generals who are landed and titled, he says, we need generals who actually have military talent. Revolutionary idea, I realize. But at the time, basically it was if you're rich or if you have a good name, then you could buy yourself a generalship. So just because you were general doesn't mean you had any military expertise at all. Pitt ends up choosing a man named James Wolfe. He was only 30. Oh, I'm six years older than him. He was only 30 when he became Britain's top, one of Britain's top generals. So our war ends up taking a different um I don't know, what do you say after that? It takes a different lane? That doesn't sound right. Anyway, the war starts going better. Turn, that's it. It takes a different turn. Sorry, I couldn't think of the word and that was driving me insane. Okay, the war takes a different turn. Um, in the summer of 1758, the British get its first major victory. It captures the fort at Louisbourg. And then eventually in the fall, they take Fort Duquesne. So we take Fort Duquesne from the French, even after they've kicked our butts, and we rename it Fort Pitt because nobody can say Fort Duquesne. It all looks like Duquesne. So we changed its name. It later becomes the city of Pittsburgh. So the city of Pittsburgh was established around the old British fort of Fort Duquesne. These victories end up getting the Iroquois to switch sides and join the British. Um, the British also win some more victories up in the Northeast, if really more like New York State. And this is going to set the British up to take Quebec. Quebec is our key battle. Um, it's the capital of New France, which is, you know, the, the French colony. It's located on a very high cliff overlooking the St. Lawrence River. That's why it's so difficult to capture. You have to either, um, well, one, you know, you don't really have to, if you're the French, you don't have to put people along that cliff side because it's like, are they going to climb a cliff? No, that's really hard. If they do that, we're going to see them coming. And so you really only have to defend one side, which is that um, side where, Someone's going to have to do a loop around to be able to enter through that side. So it's a really um, strategic area, and that's, that's why it was founded there. We have a man named General Montcalm, and he is head of the French forces. Then we have um, General Wolfe, who is head of the British. So at first, our British are just... I mean, there's a cliff. They don't know what to do. They're not doing much. But nighttime, they find a little path that allows them to get up the cliffs without being discovered. So it's, it's kind of hidden. And um, a spy actually tells them, hey, look, here's the way you get in. So in September of 15, I'm sorry, in 1757, you've got 4,000 British soldiers defeat 4,500 French soldiers on the Plains of Abraham. That's what it's called. That's where um, they fight this battle. So more than 2,000 soldiers are killed or wounded, including both of our commanders, Wolfe and Montcalm.
losing this city, losing Quebec, um, it's their main hub of everything. So once they lose Quebec, the French basically lose North America. They are unable to defend the rest of their um, North American territory. You've got Montreal up there, but it's it's more difficult to, um, I mean, they're kind of getting surrounded at this point. You've got the British coming up from all sides. So even if you do have Montreal, it's difficult to defend and it's difficult strategically to fight a war that way. Haha, -ha. the Plains of Abraham. So this is very dramatic. Um, you have our Native American man on the lower left-hand side looking on um, pensively. Personally, I like to think that he's like, haha. -ha. This is what you get. Um, James Wolfe is the guy who was very dramatically laid out there in the center. Um, this is a very, very famous painting, but obviously it's not at all what actually happened. You know, I mean, nobody was there to go, okay, well, um, lay right there, dude, while you're dying so that I can paint you. And let's see, let's arrange some of these other people around. Let's make it look real nice. But... I, I mean, you know, it gets its point across, especially considering it's a, um, like, it's a very good piece of pro war propaganda. This look, um, you know, we won, and our, our noble um, general, he died in the process, but he was very victorious, and, you know, we, we all hate that he died. So, okay, um, after we lose Quebec... After we, after we gain Quebec and the French lose Quebec. Um, in February of 1763, the British and the French sign the Treaty of Paris of 1763. Now, I say the year after the name of the treaty because there are about a million treaties of Paris. And um, they're all, um, like, they're identified by their year. So if you just say the Treaty of Paris... You're going to have somebody go, which one? The Treaty of Paris of 1763 is what ended the French and Indian War. And that is an important date. Hint, 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 hint. France loses almost all of its North American possessions. Um, most... Most of the territories that were captured were kind of returned to their original owners, but um, Britain, because they won, they get to keep most of the land that they capture. So, okay, during this time, during the war, the Spanish are also involved, because why not? And there's a little kind of they, they, they do this, like, side treaty. So the French and the British are fighting, blah, blah, blah. The Spanish and the French are like, hey, we're going we're gonna to figure out how to just, like, end this early because neither of us are doing so hot. So they have a side treaty where France has given New Orleans to Spain. And Spain says, great, now we have New Orleans. It's mine now. Britain... So that, that's our side treaty. Back to our original Treaty of Paris. Britain um, gets control of most of France's other territories. So they get the land from the Appalachian Mountains to the Mississippi River. They did retain um, some fishing rights, and they end up keeping their sugar colonies in the Caribbean. But past that, mostly we have kicked the French out of North America east of the Mississippi River. That's why um, Quebec, who they speak French now, because they started as a French colony, but the British won it in this um, French and Indian War, and so now it's part of Canada, which used to be part of the United Kingdom. The Native Americans who fight with the French really get the short end of the stick here. I mean, you should have known that. They, they get the short end of the stick all the time. They um, can't stop our British settlers now from moving into their land because the British are supposed to move out of the forts. That's not supposed to be British land anymore. So a lot more, um, all the British settlers feel a lot more um, comfortable moving into this land and pushing the Native Americans either um, further west or just, you know, 
killing them. Why not? Get rid of them. All right, so I talked about all that. Sorry. I haven't been through this slideshow in forever. Okay. Um, British is green. You know it's a picture. You can look at a picture. You understand pictures. All right, that's it.